टुडे फॉर्चुनेटली वी आर टू बी हैविंग ए रिसोर्स पर्सन डॉक्टर पी किशोर कुमार गारु फ्रॉम एनआईटी ताडेपल्ली गुडम सर इज गोइंग टू हैंडल द सेशन ऑन मॉडर्न रडार सिग्नल प्रोसेसिंग विद ए एंड एमएल फ्रेमवर्क मी विनीला मैडम प्लीज इंट्रोड्यूस आवर गेस्ट फॉर टुडे हेलो सर लिया सर हां मैम हां सर दिस इज पंदना ओके ओके मैम ओके ओके मैम ओके पंदना मैडम प्लीज कैरी ओके ओके uh today we are on the last day of our fpp program and i would like to introduce the dr puli kishor kumar who is our resource person today he is a professor of department ece of uh, national institute of technology andhra pradesh uh dr puli kishor kumar completed his btech in the year 2006 and mtech in the year 2008 both from koneru lakshmiya college of engineering guntur and phd degree in 2013 from the department of ec nit varangal currently he is working as a professor in the department of ec nit andhra pradesh he has 12 years of teaching experience his research interests are radar signal processing digital signal processing image processing antenna array processing dsp in vlsi sign deep neural networks he guided four phd students and five mtech students and more than 24 projects in the field of digital signal processing image processing radar signal processing antenna array processing communication and embedded systems at ug level he organized 11 international and national workshops training sessions courses and fdps and attended 20 seminars or workshops or fdps he also published four book chapters 15 papers in reputed journals and 40 papers in conferences his achievements are he received a n research uh, scientist uh, special travel grant from itpri 2021 from uh, israel of uh, 500 us dollars in addition the conference registration fee of 525 us dollars was also got paid in the year 2021 he received an international travel support from scrb its worth 1 lakh rupees to travel to IEEE conference held at Tel Israel in the year 2019 to receive a merit scholarship from Electronics Corporation of India Limited during BTech for the good academic record record uh thank uh, we are very glad to have you sir and i would like to hand over the session to Puli Kishor Kumar sir thank you madam uh, kishor sir Hello. Yes, sir. One second, sir. One. Second. Okay. Okay. Can you please share your screen, sir? sir i made you as a presenter sir please share your screen sir yes sir screen is visible yeah i i hope my screen is visible to you if i am not yes sir yes sir it is visible 
Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah. Mm. Very good afternoon to everyone out here. Uh, I would like to thank all the organizing members of this uh, particular uh, faculty development program, which is on impact of AI, robotics, PLS, and med in medical domains. Uh, special thanks to Ria, sir, and uh, my Guruji, Dr. Uh, Satyakumar. Uh, I'm his student, actually. Uh, he's right now working at MBVAT. So I would like to thank you to the organizers and even the principals are all there. And, uh, uh, is my voice audible, sir? Or shall I use the headphones? Uh, somewhat. Uh, okay, let, let me use the headphones, sir, so that it will be more. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, one second. Yeah, I hope uh, now it is fine, sir. Right? Now, oh, okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, once again, I would like to convey my thanks to Satyakumar, sir, and as well as the organizer, Priya, sir. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'll be dealing with uh, the topic modern radar signal processing with AI and ML framework. So, what I'll try to do in the brief uh, time is uh, I'll try to give you the introduction followed by the current technologies that are going, specifically the ultra wideband radar technology, or what is meant by ultra wideband technology that we'll try to see, and then followed by what actually the principle and operational results. I don't cover much on uh, second and third topics, but what I'll try to stress more is uh, on a fifth and sixth, even machine learning uh, basics also, it might be already covered in the uh, journey that you have had in the past uh, four, five days. Okay, so even a very brief, I'll try to give, uh, and after that, uh, um, the basic application area where I'm working, that is the UI estimation data imaging also, I'll complete. And uh, at time permits, uh, very recently, uh, one paper we presented in the Poland that also I'll share it with you. We use the machine learning framework, specifically the deep neural networks uh, we have used uh, in uh, addressing the radar imaging problem, but also uh, I'll try to share it with you. Okay. So uh, what I want to request the participants is, uh, see, I'll try to go very slowly, uh, specifically when it comes to the analysis of the results. Even uh, to understand the concepts also, I'll be a little bit uh, slow. If you want me to go a little fast, that you can able to convey it to me. And mm -hmm. not only that, if you face any difficulty in understanding, uh, uh, you are very free to, uh, um, uh, what I mean to say is, you are free to ask me, interrupt me at any point of time. It's not a big problem uh, for you people to uh, raise your hands or even to um, interrupt me. Because the uh, ultimate aim of this FTP is to make you understand about the current trends in the uh, machine learning and uh, uh, what if, if I'm not wrong, because the even the objective is the uh, impact of AI ro in robotics, VLS, and medical domains. So how this AI is going to affect even in the radar signal processing that I'll try to uh, uh, convey to you. Moreover. Uh, uh, you can you can able to make use of this in a in the domain of a, uh, that means the single processing algorithms which we uh, I'll show it to you you can make it in the hardware implementation which we are doing over here followed by uh, the future perspectives also I'll show share it with you specifically in terms of the medical domains and robotics okay yeah so what I'll try to do over here is uh, I'll straight away start with the radars so radar the basic principle and operation is something like this we are going to have uh, an antenna which is going to transmit a signal followed by a target and you can able to see over here uh, a pulse is being transmitted over here and it is going to reach uh, the target and uh, it is going to get reflected this is actually the basic principle and operation of the uh, radar and you can see over here when the pulse is about to start here you can see when the pulse is about to start here, we are not having any signal. And when even it hits also, you don't find any signal. But at the receiver antenna, you are going to have this pulse exactly when the pulse reaches this uh, receiving antenna. So basically what we'll try to do is we'll try to transmit some packet of energy towards the target. And from there, we'll be getting the echo signals. 
uh, and uh, we will try to process this ecosystem. So this is actually the basic principle and operation of this radar. Uh, there is a, a small uh, um, minute error in this particular animation. <laughs> uh, what error over here? What is the error over here? Is you can see over here uh, when the pulse is transmitting, it is just almost just like a packet, and when it hits, uh, you see when it hits, uh, you are going to have a spherical wave fronts, and a portion of that spherical wave front will Friend is getting intercepted by this particular receiving antenna, and only a portion of the energy is receiving with a uh, receiver. Of course, the single antenna is used both for transmission and receiving, uh, and uh, this is considered as a monostatic radar specifically. And the error over here is the uh, thing what it is not considered over here is during the transmission, whether it is a directional antenna or uh, directional in the sense uh, something like a parabolic dish. Or even if it can be a uh, dipole antenna, you are going to have the ultramagnetic radiations uh, traveling into the free space or launching into the free space, and then it will be propagated in the spherical wave fronts. Uh, if you try to derive the radar equation, we will be considering this impact also uh, in uh, calculating the power received by the receiving antenna. In the sense that if PD is the power that is being launched by this particular antenna, then the power that is uh, getting intercepted by this uh, uh, target is PT divided by 4 pi r square because the spherical wave of front nature also we should consider when it is traveling from the transmitting antenna to the uh, target. So that is not actually considered in this particular transmission, but practically it will be there. Okay, so you can see over here uh, the most important uh, equation what I want to say a radar does nothing but measure the round trip delay. Uh, round trip time delay, the range R is equal to C into T by 2, where T is nothing but the round trip delay. T is nothing but the round trip delay. So once you know the round trip delay, then you can make use of this particular equation to calculate this uh, range R. But it is not as simple as the calculation. See, calculating the range means there are so many algorithms. So many algorithms exist in the niche, in the literature. Uh, but uh, one simple way of looking into this problem is calculating the correlation between the uh, received echo signal and the transmitter signal. If you try to calculate the correlation, it tries to give you the similarity between two signals. So if you just try to calculate the uh, correlation, you can able to find out at what point of time the signal is received, and uh, from that you can able to uh, calculate the um, time delay. And the time delay will help us to calculate the name. But it's not as simple as that because uh, we will be having a few signals will be having more. Of, uh, noise uh, and we need to do so many pre classifications like pulse integration, uh, pulse integration, and uh, even uh, uh, range ga range gating, range gating, pulse integration. These are the things that uh, we need to do before doing the processing. Yeah, you can see over here. Here is the received power. PT is the transmitted power. PT divided by 4 pi r square. As I told you, if PT is the power that is being launched by the hand, transmitting antenna into the space, then the power received by the um, uh, received at the power, you can see here, uh, if this is the point where you are going to have the transmitter, the, the signal is going to be uh, in spherical wave fronts by the time when it reaches the target. Anyway, if PT is the power that is being transmitted and if the transmitting antenna is going to have the gain PT into G, then the power launched onto, into the space is PT into Z. Now the power received at the target is PT into Z multiplied, uh, multiplied with Z divided by 4 pi R square. Uh, and then uh, again we will be having a 4 pi R square term uh, to find out the uh, to have this uh, return spherical wave fronts uh, nature to consider that return spherical wave fronts nature of the echo signal and then uh, sigma into sigma is nothing but the uh, target cross section followed by a effective is nothing but the and the aperture of the receivers. So this is actually the received power that we need to consider and g is nothing but the gain of an antenna followed by the uh, if, if you try to substitute this, we will be having this particular equation as a receipt power. Receipt power is, uh, is in turn depending upon the gain of the antenna, wavelength, uh, radar cross section, of course, the transmitting power at the same time. You can see over here the range also. Okay. And four time, fourth power, you see here, r to the power of four. Why r to the power of four means because of the spherical wave fronts and uh, during the forward travel year and the return travel year. Uh, on technical thing, what I want to say over here is that uh, people use uh, either uh, the 
unmodulated sinusoidal signals or modulated sinusoidal signals. But you may ask uh, why modulation is required in a uh, radar. I, that's a very important question that uh, one has to consider. What is the need of a modulation? Does modulation gives any benefit, advantage, uh, advantage in a handling this uh, uh, handling the real world problems? Because we do use modulation in wireless communications, even in a wireless communications also we use EMF, many modulation, even digital modulations also, you know. So which type of modulation is actually required for this uh, and how this modulation is going to help? That will let's see. Okay, either pulse modulator or frequency modulator sensor is used for transmission depending on the application. So you can see here a single antenna followed by a target over here, considered as the narrow band. Actually, uh, the term over here that is pronounced uttered over here is narrow band radar. So what actually is the narrow band radar? Uh, if uh, we specifically say that there is a narrow band radar, is there something like wide band radar? If there is a wide band radar, what is actually the difference between narrow band radar and wide band radars? And uh, one more thing I introduced in the contents ultra wideband radar, what actually it is called ultra wideband radar that also will be can able to have on it. So, the, all these things you can able to um, actually, I'll try to differentiate all these things. Uh, it depends upon the type of the application that we are going to use. Uh, that we are going to use, and uh, the point over here is uh, it again depends upon the bandwidth. It again depends upon the bandwidth. The, you see here. Uh, Usually considered as a narrow band radar because their bandwidth is less than 10% of the sample frequency. So, when we are trying to differentiate the narrow band, wide band, and ultra wide band, we will try to differentiate in terms of the sample frequency and the bandwidth. So, the fractional bandwidth we will try to define fractional bandwidth. So, if the fractional bandwidth is uh, less than uh, fractional bandwidth, if I'm not wrong, it is the ratio of the bandwidth divided by the sample frequency. So bandwidth divided by the sample frequency. So that fractional bandwidth value, if it is less than ten uh, percent, uh, actually it is less than one percent. It is narrow band. Less than ten percent, it is wide band. And greater than ten percent, it is ultra wide band. Actually, as per the FCC regulation, the Federal Communication Commission's regulations, we need to have the fractional bandwidth greater than ten percent for, uh, for uh, the ultra wide. Okay. Anyway, what practically people use specifically is the narrow band radars because the bandwidth will be very, very small. The bandwidth will be very, very small. At the same time, the fraction of uh, central frequency is very, very large. The denominator central frequency is very, very large. Band and the central frequency will be getting very, 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 very small number because usually the central frequency is in the range of gigahertz. And the bandwidth what we use is not more. You can see here an example is there a simple pulse radar that uses 9.23 gigahertz. 9.23 gigahertz with the 20 megahertz. See, you see, 20 megahertz bandwidth is very, very small. 20 megahertz divided by 9.23 gigahertz is getting very, very small value. 0.2%. Okay. So usually we'll consider this as an element. So so why what is the need of all these types of uh, uh, red ups, you can say, you can ask the question, narrow band, white band, and ultra band, what is the need of all these things? We'll try to see if we can have So, but uh, you can able to have a look on this. This is something like a pulse modulation. Uh, and you see here, this is LFM waveform. This is an LFM waveform. That means whenever this pulse is on, whenever we are going to transmit a pulse, we'll try to transmit a sinusoidal signal instead of unmodulated sinusoidal signal during the on time. There will be on, on time and off time over here. In the on time, instead of considering the unmodulated sensor signal, we can use a modulated sensor signal. One such modulation is linear frequency modulation. So, linear frequency modulation will enhance the bandwidth of the signal. And hence, uh, you can able to consider the linear frequency modulation, even this is the other way from which you are going to see over here. This one, this is actually the step to frequency. You can see step to frequency means uh, at certain portion of time, we'll try to send a frequency of some uh, F1 frequency. Other uh, time we will be sending F2 frequency, F3, F4, F5, F6. These are the frequencies that we are going to transmit during the on time. Okay, so these two usually are considered as a wide band, a wide band uh, signals, wide band signals. And uh, what benefit will get if we try to use these things? We'll try to see now. Okay, uh, I hope so far uh, we don't have any uh, queries because uh, we are just talking about the signals that uh, are being transmitted by the radar, radar antenna. Okay, so the prospectus, the, the uh, 
many number of possibilities are there. Unmodulated waveforms you can translate, modulated waveforms you can translate. So uh, as I told you, as if you try to use the modulation, obviously the bandwidth will increase and has uh, it will become under the under the category of wideband uh, red hats, wideband red hats. So you can see here, uh, as per the FCC definition, the factual bandwidth is 2 into FH minus FL. FH minus FL is nothing but the bandwidth. And uh, the denominator is F standard frequency. Standard frequency usually will try to write as FH plus FL by 2. That's why we have in this uh, numerator 2. FH plus FL divided by 2 is considered as the central frequency. And as the factual bandwidth will be defined as the bandwidth divided by the central frequency. If this is greater than 0.2, FL and FH are the lower and higher can be. When we try to calculate the bandwidth, usually, uh, maybe we all know in the labs, when we try to calculate the bandwidth of a C amplifier, usually what we'll do is we'll do 3 dB down. C amplifier. We try to see the maximum gain, and from the maximum gain, we try to come down to 3 dB, where the power becomes half. Power becomes half, and there we try to fix the lower cutoff frequency and higher cutoff frequency, and from there we we'll calculate the. So that is actually is a 3 dB band. It actually is a 3 dB band. In C amplifier, even almost all other cases also, whenever we deal with the low pass, high pass band, all filters, uh, we always uh, uh, deal with the 3 dB band. Really but uh, uh, for the FCC regulations, uh, when you try to define ultra wide band, ultra wide band, we need to consider uh, 10 dB frequencies. 10 dB frequencies. If it is 3 dB, probably it's going to be half. 10 dB means? 10 dB means? How much it will be? So it should be. See, either pulse modulator or frequency modulator side solid is used for transmission, depending on the application. So we need to use uh, modulation specifically for this ultra wide. You can see here, this is ultra wide band and this is narrow band. In between, we will be having the wide band, which is actually, uh, sometimes we will consider a 3 dB bandwidth only even in wide band. But in ultra wide band case, uh, the power that is being transmitted is very, very less. The power, uh, yeah, that's what is being uh, uh, written over here. You see, the total bandwidth should be greater than or equal to 500 megahertz, and power spectral density is limited to minus 41.3 dB per megahertz, which is 74.1 nanowatts per megahertz. This is the maximum available limit for television companies. See, the, the point what I want to say is ultra wide band, uh, it offers a very wide range of frequencies. So if you go for the FCC regulations, I'm not sure whether the, uh, yeah, the slide is not here. But as for the FCC regulations, if I'm not wrong, 3.1 gigahertz to 10.6 gigahertz is for wireless communication. But 3.1 gigahertz to 10.6 gigahertz, that's really a very huge band. Right? So many, many applications, many real world, even wife. See, actually, this is the largest band. If you start working with the entire band of 3.1 to 10.6, uh, it will get interfered with the already existing applications, existing wireless applications. And that's the reason why the transmitting power is very, very limited. And you know, uh, if the transmitting power is greater than this minus 41.3 dB per megahertz, our televisions will get interrupted. Actually, this is the maximum allowable power limit for televisions and computer monitors so that we will never get so disturbed. If it is greater than this, means surely it will get interrupted with the existing application. That's the reason why the transmitter power is limited in ultra band. So, if that is the case, what is the application of ultra band? But we ask this question, so to some extent, I'll try to answer the question. This question's answer in this presentation. Okay. So, the minimum bandwidth that we need to have is 500 megahertz. So, if at all you are having a signal or you are having some wireless communication system with the bandwidth greater than or equal to 500 megahertz, obviously you can consider it as an ultra band. So, what are the, uh, see, uh, I told you narrowband radars, they usually don't use any modulation technique. Modulation in the sense, uh, we'll just try to transmit only a simple sinusoidal carrier to, you know, on time and off time, we'll try to do, we'll don't transfer anything because off time, we will make the receiver to be in our state. Okay, so when it comes to the wide band, we will use the modulation, and even in ultra band also, ultra band also, we'll try to use some modulation techniques, but, uh, uh, the there are some restrictions that are there for ultra wideband transmission. Now, let us see what are the key features of the narrow band radar. Narrow band radars, uh, uh, maybe uh, up to this point, you may not get that much clarity about the narrow band radar, but uh, 
uh, one point is very clear uh, the central frequency will be operating somewhere in the gigahertz or MHz or L band, X band, IOC, LSC, X band, or whatever band it is, maybe some gigahertz. But the bandwidth will be very, very small. As I told you over here, in this particular example, we have considered 20 megahertz. 20 megahertz compared to the central frequency, it will be very, very small. This is actually one of the nature of the narrow band signals. Narrow band signals, the carrier frequency will be very, very high and the bandwidth will be very, very small. Okay, so with this little information, if you try to look at the key features of the narrow band radars, you can see over here that they are narrow band. Uh, in the channel represents not a big problem because a specific band is available. That's what actually is happening even nowadays. Forget about the radar case, even now when we try to use a, a specific uh, 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 this uh, uh, TV channels, we will try to change from one frequency to other frequency. How is happening is because of the narrow band. All those signals are also narrow band. All those are also narrow band frequency. So because we can able to tune to a specific frequency so that we cannot have the interchannel interference. One person can uh, use the sun in some frequency uh, for their application, other person can use for other application, other frequency. It depends upon the uh, it depends upon the uh, channel frequency band that is available to it. So this is one of the advantage of the narrow band radar. Can have a good SNR. Yeah, the reason why we are going to have very good SNR is uh, uh, we can able to transmit as much power as possible in that particular uh, frequency so that uh, you can have a good communication link and hence a good SNR. So you can have a large transmission power. Even because uh, that particular frequency band is dedicated to only that particular application. So you, you will never have, of course, uh, uh, we need to take care of the radiation uh, issues. Uh, even if it does not create problem, then uh, we can transmit a good amount of power so that we can have a good uh, Good communication link established, and hence we can able to have a good uh, knowledge of the target specifically in this radar. So good SNR is possible using narrow band radar. Sensor signal is generated from LC oscillator. It is as simple as that, which is the simplest and uh, so the widely used electrical oscillator system because it's the only carrier that we use in narrow band radar. The resonance features of such a system makes for, make possible the frequency selection of the large number of information channels operating in common environment like space guiding and optical navigation. So usually we'll be having the resonance features of such system making possible for frequency selection. We can able to specifically select a particular frequency because see this is frequency selection is possible only in narrow band and sometimes with wide band also. Alpha wide band it's not possible as it's told if it is a 3.1 to 10.6 gigahertz, uh, everyone has to use the same uh, bandwidth of 3.1 to 10.6. Uh, there is one application that you call through the wall radar imaging or indoor environment. Uh, yeah, one thing what I want to say is uh, this Bluetooth, I think very soon it is going, I think it's already there in the market. Uh, Bluetooth is going to be replaced with a ULB short range communications where the data rate will be very, 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 very small. Other than I try to copy the uh, move from mobile to uh, laptop and uh, using Bluetooth and it took almost uh, uh, one hour, more than one hour actually. You see, uh, the data rate is very, very small. Bluetooth operates at a very small uh, data rate. So the, if the moment when we try to have more bandwidth, uh, as, well, as, per, uh, as per the communication is concerned, the capacity will increase. The data rate, you can able to have more data rate because the bandwidth is low. Okay, so such facility you are going to have you don't have a narrow band actually the narrow band band is very very small but uh, you can able to tune it to a specific frequency you can able to tune it to a specific frequency which are the frequency that you want you can able to tune just facility is available in narrow band narrow band radar's benefits and applications so actually uh, what i try to put over here is uh, it's actually the radar benefits i can say because radar can able to detect the far object beyond the scope of human even in daytime or night time i'm just saying that because Initially, uh, the radar, the most of the development is narrow band only. That, that's the reason why I just kept this slide uh, highlighting the benefits of the radar. Uh, specifically of narrow band, uh, I already told it to you, these are the key features of the narrow band radar. Okay, radar can have uh, the detection both in the daytime and nighttime, even on the land or air. Uh, I have written a here version. Uh, I hope many of you people know why radars are not being used for in a, uh, specifically oceans. Uh, radar in place of radars, we use sonars, uh, okay, earth or planets. Can even extract some features of targets like a range based or on the range based on the measurement of time delay between the transit and the reset.
ஹலோ சார் ஹலோ கிஷோர் சார் ஹலோ மேபி சம் டெக்னிக்கல் இஷ்யூ இட் ரிசோர்ஸ் பர்சன் சைட் ப்ளீஸ் வெயிட் எ வைட் சார் இஸ் கோயிங் டு ஜாயின் ஹலோ all the resource persons are requested to wait due to some network issues kishor sir is going to join within 2 minutes Yes, sir. Am I audible? Ah, yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Kishore, sir, said having some network issue. I was communicated with him. yeah sorry sir uh, sorry there is a network issue with me i hope uh, my voice is audible okay sir okay yeah. sir now your voice is audible sir yeah, our video you. is not uh, changing yeah i am just sharing sharing sir now is it okay okay ah, yes sir okay sorry sorry for the interruption okay no problem so hmm. let, let me go a little fast over here so the radar time is set to zero each time a pulse is transmitted if it was signals from the first pulse arrive after the second pulse transmission usually there will be the ambiguity for suppose if i am transmitting this pulse over here and if it reaches over here it's not a big deal uh, we can able to find out the range but uh, uh, the echo from this particular uh, pulse if we receive at this particular point uh, then usually it will be considered that this pulse as a reference and hence we will be getting the range ambiguity so to avoid this range ambiguity usually we will try to have this uh, uh, more off time maximum one amic is will be depending upon the pulse repetition time right so yeah one thing uh, i want to demonstrate here through this uh, uh, animation actually there are two targets who, uh, which are uh, 100 meters apart and we are going to have a uh, 300 meters length pulse what does this 300 meters length pulse actually the appropriate time duration is 1 microsecond we all know that uh, the speed of the light or is the thing it was uh, 3 meter or 8 meters per second 3 meter or 8 meters per second if you try to multiply it with the time you will be getting the length of the pulse so 3 to 10 to the power of 8 multiplied with 10 to the power of minus 6 if you try to 8 minus 6 you get 2 so you will be getting 300 meters of the pulse length so actually the duration of the pulse is 1 microsecond and the length of the pulse is 300 meters okay now if this particular pulse uh, go and hits the targets which are uh, very close to each other that is 100 meters apart 100 meters apart what actually is happening is you can see the return uh, echo the return, return echo looks like a, some navy blue navy blue color and you see uh, the echo from the first target and even from the second target are getting overlapped and, and the return echo is one big large pulse one big large pulse and at the receiver you are going to have only one pulse you see 
Based on that receipt process, it will say that yes, there is some target at this particular end. That's the only information what array has says. This is actually one of the problem of narrow band readers. As I told you, narrow band readers bandwidth is very, very less. Bandwidth is very less means 20 megahertz. It's appropriate time period of the pulse on time will be very large. On something like one microsecond. This is one simple example of narrow band radar. So this narrow band radar, as of uh, now, you can able to say uh, uh, there are two un unresolved targets that you can able to see because the only one return echo pulse is going to be received by the receiver, and as it will say that there is some target which is at some distance, but it cannot able to distinguish two targets which are very close to each other. Specifically, in this particular case, 100 meters apart distance targets, it is unable to. Mm, detect. Even our human eye is going to have some perspective. If we try to look at the very far objects, we cannot distinguish whether the objects are true or not because our eye is also having. Hello. Is it fine? Is it audible? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Okay. Fine. okay. So. Uh, narrow band radars because of having the large pulse uh, resolution capability is very low. That means uh, we cannot distinguish two targets which are very close to each other. So now what I'll try to do is I'll try to consider the distance between two targets. Let's assume 200 meters. So again the same pulse I try to use, but uh, now you can see two different pulses are received by the receiver. So the transmitter pulse is only one, but uh, two different pulses. Are, so two different pulses means actually what it may able to say is yes, there are two targets. So it now the radar is in a position to class to detect the two targets. Two targets are there in this particular direction. It can able to say. So that means the, to have very good resolution, which uh, good very good resolution is to distinguish two targets which are very close to each other. Specifically, this is considered as a range resolution. So in the range direction. Uh, there is something like other resolution, resolution loss there. So in the range direction, if at all two, two targets, if at all we want to distinguish two targets which are very close to each other, uh, then what we actually we require is we need to have very short length pulse. Short length pulse means as the duration of the pulse, if you try to reduce from one microseconds to let us assume 0.5 microseconds or let us assume 0.1 microseconds, even less than that nanoseconds if you go then you have you, your particular radar will be having the capability to resolve two targets which are very close to each other. These two targets you are going to resolve in the range direction. So specifically, I am talking about the range resolution. Okay, so range resolution delta R. Delta R is the distance, minimum distance that a particular uh, radar can able to detect will be depending upon the pulse duration of the target. Delta R is defined as the minimum distance along the radar line of sight between two scatterers at which they can still be detected individually. You can see here, this is the length of the pulse that is being transmitted and the distance between two targets, if we assume it as seen to tau by four, then what is going to have is, is you see, this is the overlap region that you are going to have. Very short length. Uh, the distance between two targets are very, very small and has two uh, return echoes are getting overlapped. This is the reflected pulse actually. So if the distance between two targets is seen to tau by two, they will just touch. If it is greater than seen to tau by two, uh, then obviously you'll be having two different return pulses. So it actually depends upon the tau. Tau is actually depending upon the bandwidth. Okay. Now when bandwidth comes in the picture, then you can able to understand why the bandwidth is more important in this particular radar. So now the distance between minimum distance that we need to have is, is seen to tau by two. Or C by 2B. So if bandwidth is very, very large, or if tau is very, very small, then delta R will be very, very small. Delta R is very, very small means you can able to distinguish two targets which are very close to each other. Delta R is nothing but the distance between two targets. Range is a bit. We always would like to have good range resolution. When we try to buy a TV television, also we would like to have good spatial resolution. That is spatial resolution. Uh, actually, in email processing, there is one more resolution that is called intensity resolution. Spatial resolution and intensity resolution both are different. So, spatial resolution will be giving you the spatial aspects of the picture, whereas intensity resolution will be giving you the color information. If intensity resolution is poor, then you don't find many colors in your image. So, that's purely related to the email process. But in the radars, we are going to talk about this range, range resolution. Uh, we would like to distinguish two targets which are very close to each other in the range direction. For that reason, what we would like to have is we 
you would like to have very small pulse width or large bandwidth. This is one place where bandwidth plays a key role. So if you try to have more bandwidth, you will be having very good resolution, range resolution specifically. So you can see over here, for distinguishing two targets which are very nearer to each other, very close to each other, the target pulse time period should be very small, large bandwidth is required. Hence conventional radars, and when I say conventional radars, mean these are narrow band radars. Uses narrow band signals has very poor resolution. This is one of the uh, big drawbacks of the conventional radars, and that's the reason why people started uh, switching on to the other uh, aspects. Since bandwidth is very expensive, we cannot increase the bandwidth or decrease the time frame just like that. So that we cannot do it. So that's the reason why we need to move to the alternate options. Okay. So narrow band radar range resolution. With intrapulse modulation, the moment when you try to have the pulse modulation, intrapulse modulation means we are going to use a modulation inside the pulse. Instead of sending a simple sinusoidal signals, we can able to transmit a modulated sinusoidal signals. So in that case, the bandwidth will be increasing. Uh, without intrapulse modulation, you will be having C naught into tau by two. This is the range resolution with intrapulse modulation. What, what actually you are going to do is, if you try to look over here, LFM, LFM or step to frequency. So compared to the unmodulated sinusoidal signal, these will be having more band. We all know that modulation will increase the band. So if you try to consider LFM as a frequency, starting frequency of one to ending frequency of two, the band will become F2 minus F1. Whatever the frequency that you want, you can choose. Even the stable frequency F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. These are the frequencies that you. So th th this is going to define you. You see, th this is actually the bandwidth from this particular point to this particular point. This is actually the bandwidth. With how much bandwidth you want, you can define. So this is the signal that what we are going to transmit during the on time of the transmitting pulse. So the moment when you try to increase the bandwidth by making use of the intrapulse modulation, uh, what actually happens with intrapulse modulation? You, you the bandwidth will usually increase and hence you are going to have good range resolution good range resolution because very small resolution up to 1.5 meter see why these all are required why resolution doesn't really matter so yeah when it comes to the remote sensing remote sensing radars uh this resolution plays a key role actually okay so radar doesn't uh, means that it only used for calculating the range of the target calculating the velocity yeah these are the basic uh, uh, applications of the radars, but uh, there are advanced applications also. Getting the remote sensing, radar surveillance, uh, the region will try to surveillance by making use of the radar and then we'll try to get the, it's not the camera picture where we can able to see the colors of each and every object. Radar cannot identify the color of an object. No, radar cannot do this. But intensity profile images, it can, it can able to generate. What is this intensity? Of our images. That means, uh, based on the reflectivity, it is going to give some intensity value. Intensity range for images, intensity profile images, it will be giving for us. So, uh, in that particular case, uh, resolution actually plays a key role. Okay. So, radars usually are classified as primary and secondary radars. Uh, even imaging radars, non imaging radars are also there. So, mostly my work. Of course, uh, to some extent, I concentrate more on radar imaging and uh, non-imaging radar, specifically direction of error estimation. This is another application where I am working. That information from LCM. So many applications are there: military imaging radars, radar gun, automatic radars, civil aviation radar radars, GPR, GPR for detecting the landmines. This is very much required. This is actually the fundamental topic. Why I try to introduce this over here is. Uh, to introduce the topic of azimuth resolution because we have seen the range resolution so far there is a concept like azimuth resolution also so what is that azimuth resolution that you will come to know maybe after seeing a couple of slides from here okay so this is a simple dipole antenna and we all know the basic physics behind this dipole antenna it is going to have something like a h like structure and you can see here this is the three dimensional radiation pattern okay so the dipole antenna we tries to radius in this particular direction eight eight pattern we are going to have it's not it's a simple omnidirectional and maybe you can assume that okay so yeah this is the radiation pattern what you are going to have so from the top view you'll be getting circle uh, left view, uh, this uh, this side view you'll be getting eight pattern this side also you'll be having eight pattern and if you ready to look over here the beam width is, will be very very large more uh, coverage actually these uh, dipole antennas one of antennas will be using only for more coverage instead of uh, directivity more uh, specific direction uh, we'll be having good uh, 
how to play make use of this uh, type land. Okay, so PMT is a very, very large concept. Okay, you can see this is an, another example of a directional land. Unlike this, where the coverage is the basic motto, here the coverage is not the basic motto. Here the basic motto is. Uh, see uh, directional you see the beam width half power beam width you see this is the half power if you try to calculate this half power beam width for this one it will be very very large you see half power beam width the angle will be very very large this antenna this is the antenna gain at a different angles for a specific frequency okay so here the beam width will here direction is more important here the direction is more important see directional antenna the purpose is the directivity. We would like to have good directivity using directional. Okay. So when we discuss about azimuth resolution, this directivity plays a key role. Directivity plays a key role. You see, one good example of this directional antenna is the horn antenna. Okay. So here, parabolic dish is also a directional antenna. Yeah, I used to ask the, this question to the students. Very big parabolic dish and very small parabolic dish. If you try to compare these two, uh, the very big parabolic dish is going to have a very good directivity as compared with the small parabolic dish. Okay, because a small parabolic dish, of course, it is a directional only, but the beam width will be a little large compared to that of a very big uh, parabolic dish. Usually, this very big parabolic dishes we will be using, the, uh, it will be used in specific like atmosphere, the uh, uh, satellite tracking, satellite tracking, or a uh, yeah, even uh, this KVD operators also sometimes use a big uh, parabolic dish as well. Mm, recently, uh, not recently, uh, other day I have read a news in a chain, I think about 15 football grounds size of big parabolic dish they have uh, made 15 football grounds size parabolic dish to sense the space, the space, to sense the space. Okay? So usually as the size of the this increases, the directivity will increase. Okay, yeah, you can see over here. I realize the point radiator. This is a the reference antenna which we will try to consider. It is an isotropic antenna radiation pattern, then the omega isotropic radiation pattern, and radar dish. This is the direction antenna. Okay? Some uh, parabolic dish antenna radiation pattern. Okay, now when it comes to the azimuth angular resolution or azimuth resolution, high directivity of radar antennas. Uh, will be having very small beam width and have small resolution. Just like the concept what we have discussed in range resolution, even in azimuth resolution also, you would like to identify two targets which are very close to each other. The concept remains the same. Uh, good resolution, good range resolution means you would like to identify two targets which are very close to each other. Up to this statement, uh, in both the cases it is the same. But uh, uh, in the case of range resolution, you would like to identify two targets which are very close to each other in the range direction. In the azimuthal or angular resolution, uh, we would like to identify two data which are very close to each other in the azimuthal direction. What is this azimuthal direction? So you can see over here, uh, if I try to have one target somewhere over here, in, let me use this one. Yeah. So if I try to have one target somewhere over here, another target somewhere over here, within this slope, within this slope, what actually this particular receiver is going to do is because I received the signal from this particular direction, uh, it can able to say that there is some target within this particular angle. There is some target. It cannot distinguish two targets because both the targets lying inside this particular main lobe. So you will try to understand this. Uh, if you try to have very narrow beam width, uh, even though the targets are very close to each other in the angular direction, if the beam width is very, very narrow, then you'll be getting two different echo signals because the beam weight is getting rotated over here. So basically what I want to say over here is the angular resolution is depending upon the range. See, there the range resolution doesn't depend upon the range as such. Okay, range resolution only depends upon the pulse width. Two are in sine theta by two. Uh, one good example I'll tell you. If you take a torch, if you take a torch and if you try to uh, Put it on the wall. That is the gym. I will try to light the torch, and then uh, you can see that the, the small circle you can able to see on the torch, uh, on the wall. If you try to, as you move far away from the wall again, and if you try to put the same torch, the circle goes on increases and increases and increases. So that's the reason why, as you move away from the target, as as your 
far away from that, the, that particular azimuthal resolution is reduced. So that doesn't mean that uh, we should be very close to the target. What actually we, we need to do is we need to have a very narrow beam width. Very narrow. Obviously, the targets, uh, usually the targets will be very far to the, see, uh, very far to the ground, uh, radar, actually. So uh, usually in that particular case, what we'll try to do is we'll try to have very narrow beam width. Very narrow beam width. That narrow beam width uh, will pinpointly help us to identify two targets which are very close to each other in azimuthal direction. Okay, so you can see here the azimuthal or angular resolution will be depending upon the range as well as this theta. This theta is nothing but the beam width. This theta is nothing but the beam width. You can able to have a simple mathematical analysis over here to get this particular expression. So azimuthal resolution, two types of resolutions I have introduced. Azimuthal resolution and range resolution. These two are key parameters both in direction of arrival estimation and uh, uh, direction of arrival estimation and radar imaging. Okay, in direction of arrival estimation, specifically now in a 5G technologies also, whenever it is required, because we will be using beamforming techniques. We will be using whether it is another digital beamforming techniques. We would like to identify the user in a specific direction. Once we try to identify the direction of the user, then we will try to transfer only in that particular direction so that. Uh, it's not required to transmit the entire signals, right? So beamforming or direction of arrival estimation is one of the good applications in 5G also, okay? So the important concept of what I have conveyed to you as of now is uh, the range resolution and angular resolution of your radar. So far, if you have any doubts, you can ask me. Otherwise, I'll try to go ahead with the uh, next slides. Any doubts so far? Okay, uh, again, I gave you the option. You can interrupt me at any point of time. That will really help me uh, to give more details uh, based on your understanding. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this is actually one example of the radar received signal. The reason why I have included over here is it is something like a noisy waveform. Even it is much more noisy than this one. It's just an example case. You see, if I try to have a threshold somewhere over here, you see, uh, two things, three things I try to keep over here. If I try to keep the threshold somewhere over here, What's happening over here is uh, these are the three targets that was uh, available, uh, and this target we can able to detect. This target we can able to detect, but this target it is actually missing because you have considered the threshold somewhere over here. So what we'll try to do is we'll try to calculate the received signal energy, and we'll try to calculate the receive, compare the received signal energy with some threshold value. And if uh, the received signal energy is greater than the threshold value, we'll try to assume that there is a a target otherwise uh, uh, you see that target is not there so if that is the case if you try to have a uh, larger threshold value then there is a chance of missing the targets uh, there is other way around also if you try to reduce the threshold and if you try to keep something like this yes no doubt this target has been detected all the three targets have been detected but unfortunately some noise also were considered as not at the time this is considered as a probability of false alarm there is no target but still my receiver is saying that there is a time. So this is actually the probability of also. This estimation theory will give you the complete result. Maybe if my permits, uh, sometimes mathematical analysis of this, uh, I may mean, convey it to you. Okay, as of now, many issues are there in radar signal processing. Uh, identifying the target is one of the biggest tasks. Identifying the sense whether the target is there or not. So many detection techniques uh, were there in the literature. So many estimation techniques are there in the literature. Okay, so noise spikes also sometimes creates the false alarm. Uh, usually, people use match repeater to overcome this. Match repeaters. Okay. So these two are considered as a false alarm. If you try to consider the threshold level one, if you consider threshold level one, these two are considered as a false alarms. Uh, false alarm means there is no target, but still uh, because of the noise, uh, it will say that there is some target over here. That's the reason why we are calling it false alarm. Uh, when you try to consider the threshold level two, actually this one will be considered as the target missing. For threshold two, these two targets will be identified very comfortably, but uh, this is missing when we try to use threshold two. Yeah, so just give the brief background of the radar signal processing. Actually, I haven't given the brief background. Only two parameters I try to emphasize are there. Uh, two or three parameters. One is the resolution, uh, both angular resolution and uh, range resolution, and the need for the narrow band and wide band radars. And then uh, the, at last, uh, I just give. Uh, Simple received waveform of a radar and what are the issues that pops up specifically 
uh, when we try to have a noise reduction. I'll just give a glimpse of machine learning also. Uh, maybe other kind of experiments. Maybe the next one now, uh, I'll share the research of what I'm doing about it. Okay. So yeah, people nowadays are very fond of this machine learning, right? So uh, machine, we would like to make the machine to learn so that it will do our work. That's actually the concept behind this machine. Learning. We'll make the machine to learn. That's what the machine does, right? We can make our kids to learn. We can make uh, people to learn. Now we are making uh, machine to learn, OK? So machine learning is a study of algorithms that uh, improve their performance at some task with experience. So this experience is actually the uh, notion that usually we in our daily life have. We, Based on the experience, we try to give appropriate suggestions, right? That's what we are expecting even the machine to do for us. That's what the machine learning is. So optimize the performance criteria using example data or past experience, automating the automation, getting computers to program themselves, tracking software is a bottleneck. Uh, let the data do the work you study. See, uh, conventionally, yeah, some examples over here. Uh, what is the machine learning? Traditional programming and what actually the machine learning? In traditional programming, what we we'll try to have is we we'll try to have some data and we'll try to even have the program. We'll try to write the program and we'll give the input and we'll try to make use of this program to get the output. This is what actually the traditional programming will do. But in the machine learning, what we'll try to do is we'll try to give the data and we'll try to give the output also. And now the task over here is uh, let the computer write the program for themselves so that uh, it will try to give this output for this particular data. So that's the reason why it is machine learning. Writing software is the bottleneck. Okay. So machine learning, uh, we will give both the input and output. Okay. For this input, I am going to get this output. For this. So I am training the machine. I am training the machine such that it will write its own program. What are the program that it wants? It let it write. But, uh, I would like to have this output for this input. That's what the machine learning does. Okay. So usually what we'll do is we'll uh, sow the seeds and then we'll give the nutrients that and we have to do some maintenance and then plant children. This is the usual flow. So it is something like we'll try to have some algorithms and the nutrients data will be there and we will write the programs. It's behind the algorithms and we'll have the data. And as a gardener, we need to do some maintenance. We we'll write the program such that for this particular data, what we'll be getting some output. Okay. But we we'll don't do like this anymore. We don't do anything like this anymore because uh, we will be having both input and output. You see here this uh, block, uh, both the data, input and output we are going to have. And the computer has to write a program. No more uh, the programs will start it. Writing in the sense uh, for the given application. Okay, so every machine learning algorithm has three components. We need to represent the data, we need to evaluate, and we need to optimize. These are the basic three steps that we do in each and every machine learning. So uh, if you try to make so many, so many neural network applications exist in the iteration, okay. So all we can uh, bring to this particular umbrella in the sense the best way of representing the data, and that data will try to perform the evaluation. After evaluation, we'll be getting some output. Whether that output is uh, close to our true value or not, that will check it. If it is not, we'll try to optimize the parameters. Optimization is the key aspect. Okay, I even teach this optimization also, maybe at some point of time, whenever it, uh, it comes into the video, we'll try to see about this optimization, maybe in future. So for representation, so many ways are there. Decision trees you can use. Uh, set of rules or logic programs in statistical graphical models, neural networks. We can use support formations, model and so forth. These are the representational algorithms. The best way of representing the given data. You know, uh, will be after after representing the data, we'll be getting some feature vector. We'll be getting some feature vector. So for the, getting the good feature vectors, many ways are there. Even neural networks are used to get the good representation of it. And then evaluation, uh, when it comes to the evaluation, what we'll try to do is we'll be having some cost function. So different cost functions do exist, accuracy, precision, mean square error also can be used, squared error, squared error, likelihood, posterior property, cost, utility, margin, and so these all are considered as a cost function. But optimization uh, will optimize the cost function. As I told you over here, uh, 
the represent is the best way of doing the representation. Many techniques you can use that. Now, once we get the representation, we will try to have some objective function or cost function to evaluate the performance, and then optimization is going to optimize the performance. Okay, so representation is over. Evaluation. These are different uh, evaluation objective functions that we can able to use, and then we'll try to perform the optimization. So yes, you can have. Uh, Many number of optimizers that are available. The optimization is a very vast area. Okay, learning optimization is very good for the machine learning engineer. Amino trolial optimization, convex optimization, constraint optimization. Uh, constraint optimization usually will be considered as linear programming. Non-linear programming is also there. Uh, nature inspired algorithms do exist. Uh, usually, people use uh, maybe many of the faculty members also know this thing. Uh, Adam optimizer. Adam optimizer it is uh, some way related to this gradient descent algorithm. Okay, uh, gradient descent or uh, uh, what we can steep steepest descent or gradient descent algorithm. Step, step size if you try to break, then it is gradient descent. Otherwise, it is steepest descent algorithm. So Adam optimizer is uh, uh, related to this uh, gradient descent algorithm. So what these optimizers are going to do is they are going to optimize the parameters such that the performance. Evaluation performance of evaluation will be made better and better and better after every iteration. Okay, so this is actually the basic uh, uh, brief idea behind this uh, machine learning. Machine learning problems can be categorized as something like this: you can have supervised and unsupervised learning. You can have discrete and continuous. When it is a supervised learning or discrete, it can be considered as classification because we are going to have discrete outcomes. And we are going to have supervised learning. Supervised learning means there will be some reference data that is available. So it is something like a classification. It is something like oh, one good example is yeah, I am training the model with, uh, uh, with uh, different images of fruits. I'll uh, give an image and I'll say that this is the apple. Do you remember it? This is the orange. Do you remember it? This is actually considered as a supervised learning because we are going to have discrete outputs: apple, orange, banana. These are the discrete outputs. Okay, and what we are doing is supervised learning. Why I am saying is, where you training, we are going to have some reference output that we are going to have. We are supposed to have. There is something like unsupervised learning also. In unsupervised learning, what we try to do is we don't have the. We usually we will not have the reference uh, data. Reference data in the sense for this particular image, what should be the output that we don't have. In the sense, the only the better way is to perform this clustering operation. That is unsupervised and discrete. When it comes to supervised learning continuous, it is something like a regression. Regression, something like interpolation. Uh, if your data is given to you, and if you are supposed to uh, interpolate the data, maybe at some other value, which is not available in the given data. So what we will try to do is we will try to interpolate. We will try to perform the regression analysis, and we will try to have interpolation function, and from there we can able to get the function value at any any input for any input. Which is not available in the given text. So dimensionality reduction we'll try to use in unsupervised learning and specifically continuous. Okay. So these are the machine learning problems that are practically available. So clustering strategies, so many clustering strategies were there. So I'm talking about unsupervised learning. Uh, then uh, we are going to have this uh, supervised learning. Supervised learning, particularly discrete. This is an example. Apply prediction function. To a feature representation, so this is an image of an apple, I'll say, and uh, we will try to. Our ultimate aim of this machine learning is to approximate this f. F is nothing but the function. Apply a prediction function to a feature representation of the image uh, to get the desired output. Apple, tomato, cow. This comes under the classification. Okay, clustering strategies, so many other ones. So our aim is to find out the prediction function. Output is there, input image is there. We would like to find out what actually is the prediction function. Training, giving given a training set of labeled examples, estimate the prediction function f by minimizing the prediction error. Minimizing means optimizing the prediction error on the training data set. Testing, apply f. Now, once uh, the training is completed, we will do the testing. So now, what we will try to do is we will try to make use of the predicted function f. And we'll apply it to the never before seen test example X and output the predicted value. This is actually the test training test. Okay. So you can see over here, you know, these are the training images that you are going to have. We will extract the image features, 
abstracting image features, as I told you. This is actually the representation. Representation. The very first uh, thing what we are going to have. Representation. For this representation, we are going to have easy many uh, options. Basically, you can use calculus, instances, actual models, neural networks also you can use, many things you can use. Once we have a good representation, then we will try to make use of computer training. We will do the training with the training levels. Then we will be having a learned model. Once you get the learned model, what you will take? You will take the test image. This image features will extract and will read this to the learned model. And then you will get the production. That's what the test. Basic audio. Okay. Uh, you might have already completed the basic details. Even you might have gone even to the depths of this machine learning also. But uh, whatever is required for the coming uh, slides, I'm just giving kind of it. In practice, so machine learning, you can have understanding domain, prior knowledge goals, data integration, traction feedback, pre processing, learning models, interpreting this, consolidating and deploying in this current knowledge, and uh, we'll let you work. So understanding knowledge, prior knowledge, and goals, data integration. We'll try to do the data integration. Okay. Yeah, and now we'll uh, switch on to the one of the practical aspects of this um, LL signal block. That is required. So, two resolutions we have seen one is a uh, azimuthal resolution and uh, azimuthal or angular resolution. The second one is a uh, range resolution. Okay, so azimuthal resolution, azimuthal or angular resolution plays a key role over here in this device. So, one thing what we have seen is uh, for having a good azimuthal resolution, you can have a very, very narrow beam width. And we know that for having a narrow beam width, uh, the antenna aspective of the radius should be as big as, as large as possible. As one example I told you, uh, to sense the space, uh, almost 15 football stadiums uh, size uh, thermal dish antenna, which is made by the chains. So you can uh, think of that, okay, how much uh, uh, resolution one can expect, specifically the angular resolution. Uh, so in this DOA estimation concept, what we're going to do is uh, we will try to have some target in the field space and we would like to specifically uh, identify the angle of arrival. Angle of arrival. Direction of arrival is more or less the same amount of the angle of arrival. So when we are very specific about this angle of arrival, if you would like to have very good high accuracy angle of arrival estimation, then very sure you need to have very narrow beam width, pencil beam. So for that reasons, uh, what actually we do is instead of having a uh, physically big antenna, we will try to we will try to use the uh, synthetic aperture, synthetically generated aperture. So actually, aperture of an antenna is the physical area of an antenna that is exposed to the receiving signal. If that effective aperture of an antenna is very, very large. So increasing the size of the antenna means increasing the effective aperture of the antenna. If you try to have good effective aperture of the antenna, then you, obviously you'll be having a very good beam width, very, very small beam width. Very small beam width. So instead of having physically very large effective aperture of the area of the antenna, we will synthetically generate the aperture. Synthetically generate the aperture. Okay, that's why we will call it as a synthetic aperture radar. Synthetic aperture radar. Synthetic aperture radar means physically we don't have very big antenna. Antenna with very big effect, very large effective aperture. Radar. But synthetically, we will try to generate that effect, big, very large effective aperture radar, such that we will be getting the resolution similar to that of the very big antenna with the large effective aperture. Radar. Okay, so this is the concept. So you can see here, this is the linear antenna where we use only two and two antenna dipoles. So if you try to compare with a single dipole antenna, this particular two element array dipole antenna will be having, uh, I mean, beam width, less beam width. Okay. So linear array, usually linear array can be used for electronic steering. Electronic steering in the sense, if you try to feed each and every antenna element with the appropriate phases, then uh, uh, we will be having a very directional radiation pattern, unlike the individual antenna radiation pattern. 
we know that the individual antenna radiation pattern, if it is a dipole antenna, usually it is the eight like structure. Usually it will be used only for the cover, is not for the directional purpose. But the moment when we try to physically uh, physically incorporate an array antenna, when we try to have an array antenna, so this array antenna will be having a very high directional radiation pattern. That's the reason why people use this uh, uh, arrays for electronic steering. Instead of mechanical steering, we'll use the array antennas for electronic steering of the beam beam. Okay, so we may call it as phase arrays antennas also because each and every antenna element, uh, see the signal that we are transmitting, uh, feeding to the each and every antenna are getting deferred by the phase, you see. A not into E power J phi not A one into E power J phi not A two into E power J phi and so A into E power J. See some phase uh, difference we'll try to have. If for suppose if I call the signal is X of T, X of T if I try to feed it to the element one, A one, X of T. A two will be X of T multiplied with some phase E power J phi not. A three will be X of T E power J two phi not or two phi E power J three phi E power J four phi. That means there will be a phase. Introduction. So, a simple phase does it uh, makes uh, the beam to have a very uh, narrow beam width, and uh, that still helps us to steer the beam. Yes, it is possible. So that's what the electronic steering concept. By the way, I'm not much uh, dealing with this uh, electronic steering, but uh, phase there and you know, each and I element can be controlled individually by phase or time. The time will by changing the feeding. It is possible to construct a directed beam that can be. Reposition electronically. Amplitude control can be used for a pattern shaping. The beam can be pointed to new direction, narrowed, or widened in microseconds. An array that has a main peak at a certain angle can also have other peak values depending on the space between the antenna arrays. Anyway, uh, this is the concept of the phase array antennas. So, antenna arrays' basic purpose is to increase the gain and directivity, which is not possible to have without antenna. The radiation pattern obtained by a single antenna element may not be desired, particularly in the tracking. When it comes to the tracking applications, we should be very, very specific about the angle. Okay, so specifically in this tracking application. As there are more variables to control the radiation pattern in antenna element, the desired radiation pattern can be obtained as desired. Whatever is our desired, that we can able to get it from this antenna element. The fact is that the design radiation pattern of an antenna set, the number of elements that we are using to have the antenna array, physical arrangements, because we can have linear array, 2D array also we work, uh, three-dimensional arrays also are there. I'm sure you can have and a phase of the input signal of the array. So this is a uniform linear array, where non-uniform linear array is also there, uh, something like a sparse, uh, sparse uh, signal processing, actually. Uh, right this theorem says that we can have we need to sample at a two in the No, now there is a concept of computer sensing where even if you try to sample it with a fraction of the Nyquist sampling rate, you still can able to reconstruct. That's another concept of compressive sensing. Uh, a little uh, similar to that is sparse series. Sparse series means see here you are going to have uniform linear array where the distance between two and elements is fixed, and that is the Sparse arrays means you are going to have non-uniform this uh, non-uniform spacing of the antenna elements. Okay, so this mathematical aspects maybe if you are even interested, you can have a look on it. So what you are going to have over here is the first element. Uh, see, this is in the receiver receiver mode. So here it is a transmitting mode. Transmitting mode we are going to be having in the electronic stream. But in the receiver mode, what we are going to have is uh, this is the target. And let's assume that signal is a kind of some target S of T is a signal. So when it reaches to this particular antenna area, what actually is happening is uh, the element which is very close, very close in the sense. Of course, uh, why we have drawn the parallel lines over here means the target is very, very far away from the uh, uh, linear array. And at the same time, uh, we are assuming the spherical wavefronts of the alpha waveform that is reaching the antennas. And hence, you'll be having a plane waves. The spherical wavefront, wave, wavefronts, uh, if the distance between the target and the receiver is very, very large, the spherical wavefronts will become a plane waves. And uh, once it is a plane waves, then what actually happens is uh, there will be the path difference uh, in the sense that uh, if uh, this particular signal is uh, uh, 
received over here, then there will be a path distance of this angle. Extra path is being traveled by the signal when it reaches to this angle element, and the same thing is going to happen for the remaining element. If I write to consider that there is no extra path, zero extra path for the first reference angle element, then as we move towards the left side in this particular scenario, uh, D sin theta is the extra path that is traveled by the waveform, and 2D sin theta, 3D sin theta, 4D sin theta, and so on. We are going to have the extra path difference. And that is actually creating the phase difference in the receiver signal. Okay. So it is something like this e power minus j omega tau k x1 t. e power minus j omega tau k is going to be k d sin theta by t. You see here, uh, d sin theta is the extra part. For the second element, you'll be having 2 minus 1 into d sin theta. 2 minus 1 in, means 1 d sin theta. d sin theta by v, you'll be getting the time. So that time delay we are going to impart it over. So this is the received signal at the kth antenna position, kth antenna element. So xk, you are going to have this equation. With respect to x1 of t, x1 of t, there is no phase. So phi is equals to pi by lambda into this antenna. So this actually, uh, we will try to have the summation of all the received signals so that uh, SI of t, you can see here, SI of t, this SI of t is going to have the bigger. If there is only one source, then you will be adding S1 of t, two sources, S2 of t, the same equation we are going to have. Okay, you see, XK of t is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to m. Here, i is nothing but the number of targets that we have considered. For m targets, m different such waveforms, we will be appending it with m different noise sources. So, we will write, write, this is actually the error factor matrix. Is actually there effect. So, this goes to eight. So, uh, what I want to make you to convey is uh, this direction of variable estimation is one of the important things that we need to address specifically. Whether it is in radar triangles, when it is, it is radar triangles, it's not just a simple identifying the angle of variable. It is we need to track it actually. Okay, that's a completely different scenario. Many tracking algorithms do exist. Okay, but uh, this angular parallel estimation is also equally important. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, so this x of t the received antenna signal is equal to a steering vector matrix A multiplied with the received signal s of t plus n. So in this uh, uniform linear the uniform linear radiation pattern is something like this. We will be having array factor pattern, and uh, you can see here the field pattern array factor of four isotropic sources, and this is the radiation pattern of the single. Dipole antenna and uh, the product of these two you'll be having this is the field radi field pattern of the four collinear dipoles. Four collinear dipoles means we are going to have four dipole antennas. Four that means four uh, the length of the array is the four. Okay, you see, this is the single dipole antenna radiation pattern, and when you try to keep all those uh, in in linearly arranged, then you are going to have very directional direction. Many algorithms are there conventionally to address this problem. But how this machine learning is going to help us to identify this angle of arrival or direction of arrival estimation? That I'll try to explain to you. Uh, this is some background information. Again, uniform rectangular array. So, rectangular array also is possible, and you'll be having the uh, two dimensional radiation pattern actually. This is the two dimensional radiation pattern. You can see this is a simple one dimensional radiation pattern. If theta and phi both, we are going to see if here uh, using this linear arrays, you can able to measure theta, but here both theta and phi you can able to measure. These are the, some simulations that were done by my research scholar. Uh, LL shape array, you'll be having something like this uh, the uh, radiation band, product of 2D array factors. Actually, these are the array factors, only. it's not the radiation band. This has to be multiplied with the, the radiation pattern to get the uh, actual radiation pattern of the uh, antenna, actual radiation pattern of the array. Okay, so L shaped array factor, T shaped array factor, you can able to have something, F shaped array factor. F shaped means with M is equals to 10 and N is equals to 10. You see here, uh, M is equals to 10 and N is equals to 10. So maybe this is the 10 and this is also 10. Plus shaped that. DO estimation algorithms for one D uniform linear array. So many are there in the literature, correlation based DO estimation, ML based music algorithm, is field map dispense pattern, many are there. Uh, so I, I'm not much uh, 
dealing with this one because these are the conventional methods, but how we try to solve this using machine learning that I'm trying to learn. The concept of the correlation based uh, DO estimation, we will try to just correlate the receiver signal with the transmitter signal so that we can able to identify the phase. Okay, more than that. Maybe mathematical analysis, you can have that concept. Correlation based DO estimation has uh, some issues. Their maximum likelihood of DO estimation, music algorithm, these are all conventional. Uh, conclusion. Yeah, yeah, come to the sensing based DO estimation. So, computer sensing based DO estimation, uh, maybe uh, I'll deal it maybe at the end if time permits, but let me move on to this DO estimation using deep learning because this is what we would like to have. How the DO estimation problem is going to be handled by the machine learning. So, the problem of DO estimation can be framed as a classification problem. What does this classification problem? Uh, uh, initially, when in, in the machine learning phase, I told you that we are going to have a classification problem specifically supervised learning where we need to classify different fruits tomato, mango, apple. These are different classes that we are going to fix beforehand itself. So, likewise, we need to fix the classes. So, once you are specific about the region, for suppose, let us assume that my targets will be in the range of minus 60 to plus 60. So minus 62 plus 60, I need to define some classes. Some classes, but each angle will be one class. Minus 60 is one class, minus 59 is one class, minus 58 is one class, and so on up to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. With a single, see, classes means you can define as much as, see, it's up to you how much accuracy of the angle of arrival estimation you are expecting. Based on that, we need to uh, divide. But uh, is it that much efficient? Uh, again, we need to check out for the other methodologies also. Or you can even combine the existing deep learning architecture with the conventional method so that you may get uh, with less little less computational efficiency, you can able to estimate the angle. Anyway, so let's uh, start with the single source case in the classification problem where each angle is considered as a separate class, multi class classification problem. Multi class, multiple classes are there. In the regression problem, where a single output target can be any of each angle. See, only one output we are going to have for multiple sources. The angles of multiple sources by framing the estimate of multiple sources as multi class, multi level classification. Multiple sources means uh, we are going to have a number of targets in the space. Okay, let's look into the problem. So, in deep learning, the problem of direction of an estimation can be formulated as classification problem. So what we try to do is we will try to have uh, the received signal. So in, in, see, in the DO estimation, we will be having the received signal. Received signal, for suppose, if I try to have n antenna elements, we will be having n antenna elements received data. n antenna elements received data. And that received data usually will be in the complex in nature. Complex in nature. Uh, so it will be having the real part and imaginary part. Real part and imaginary part. And uh, uh, the number of targets are, lab uh, are, are labeled as 21, minus 10 to 10 degrees. As a first step of uh, uh, incorporating the machine learning, uh, deep learning framework for the estimation, what we have taken is we consider the angles from minus 10 to plus 10, where 21 classes are available. Here we consider each angle as a class. The classical categorical cross entropy is used as the loss function, and Adam optimizer is used. Activation function at the output is softmax activation, where we have considered. So we, in, at the initial stage, we consider 300 layers, a number of neurons in each, each hidden layer to 300 and 50. That means the hidden layer 150, hidden layer 200. So it's a, something like MLP based. Learning rate 1 into epoch minus 5 and epoch 100. So for 21 classes, 10,000 samples are used. See, uh, for what is the data that we are using, giving as input to the neural network? The data is the received signal. The received signal usually will be complex data. So the real part and imaginary part of the received signal followed by, you see here, uh, the inputs for this are three, real part, imaginary part, and then the angle. Okay, let's see that. So 10,000 samples are used for eight, which 80% are used for training and 20% is used for testing. The validation set is taken as 10% of the training set, okay? So from the training, we have taken 10% for the validation. Okay, after training, usually we'll do the validation and then we'll go for testing. 
we have known that if the validation loss is increasing while our training loss is decreasing, then it is it means that there is a problem of overcrowding. You see here. Uh, actually, I should have shown you the architecture here so that uh, uh, things will be more uh, more good for you. Anyway, maybe next time I, uh, I, I'll try to update my presentation. It will be good enough. Training, validation loss, and accuracy. If you, you, you see here, the training will be something, the blue color and validation is some uh, orange color. And you know, training and validation accuracy. Here, deep learning model is used to classify 21 angles. As I told you, DOI estimation, we have chosen by considering the angles ranging from minus 10 to plus 10. What is this minus 10 to plus 10 degrees? Maybe that, that is not here. Minus 10 to plus 10 means uh, I can say something like this. Uh, let me give you some. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can see over here. Uh, yeah, you can see. So if the end area is something like this, minus 10 to plus 10 means uh, the, the, uh, from, from with the vertical, 10 degrees angle to the right and 10 degrees angle to the left. So this very small range, I am concerned. Within this particular range, uh, we are going to have minus 10 to plus 10 degrees. That means that uh, minus 10 to plus 10 degrees is the angle with respect to the vertical. So this is minus 10 to plus 10 degrees. We are going to divide it into 21 classes with one degree variation. Minus 10, minus 9, minus 8, minus 7, like that. So these 21 classes, we are going to have classification by making use of the MLP-based neural network, where we are going to have three hidden layers. Uh, three hidden layers. Uh, yeah, you can see. Three hidden layers we are going to have. In hidden layer one, we are going to have 50 neurons. Hidden layer two, 100 neurons. It is a 350 neuron. This is the basic architecture we are going to have. Okay. Now, the input layer, we are going to have only three. Uh, you see, the number of features are 20 into excess, and this is the real part and imaginary part of the receives. Real part and imaginary part of the receives is going to be considered. Okay. So now you can see here a uh, deep learning model is used to classify 21 angles. The performance metrics of deep learning models are training last. Uh, Training accuracy, validation loss, and validation accuracy. The model seems to be performed well as training loss follows the validation loss up to 60 epochs. Uh, we can uh, stop at 60th epoch, something like uh, this one. Uh, as there is overfitting, validation loss increases, but training loss decreases. Um, we can further improve the model accuracy by changing the hyperparameters. So uh, let me, I think there should be some case of this case study with this. We can conclude from uh, above graph the testing accuracy and loss is pretty similar to that of the validation. This is testing loss, testing accuracy uh, as a regression. Note that training and validation data, the model is trained on this data, testing data. The, see, it, in the sense, when we go when we go for a training, we will try to consider the case. Uh, you, you see, uh, D is equal to one source. D is equals to one source, we'll consider. Uh, the number of features, D is equals to one source means uh, uh, we'll try to generate the received data. We'll try to generate the received data. The received data is the complex number. So for each and every angle. So if the target is at minus 10, what will be the received data? Target is at minus 9, what will be the received data? Target is at, for all possible combinations, we'll try to generate the received data and that data will try to feed it to this. Uh, you see, for so far, 21 classes, 10,000 samples are used. 10,000 samples uh, means uh, uh, you 20. Uh, see, uh, we are going to have this 10,000 samples for each and every angle. All, all the 10,000 samples for each and every angle. Okay, so 80% are used for training and 20% is used for testing. Okay, so have a regression problem. You can also in deep learning the problem of DO estimation can be formed as a regression problem. Okay, okay. Training loss, bad size. Okay. The training loss for bad size one. If the bad size is equal to one, the gradient distance algorithm is known as stochastic gradient distance algorithm. Training loss during regression. Training loss during regression of wide scale as training loss. Okay. So, full training samples and algorithm is known as mini batch gradient distance algorithm. So, yeah, by changing different parameters, something like batch size and learning rate, how the performance of the angular parallel estimation is going to be affected. Yeah, I think uh, 
this is the neural network architecture that was used. Yeah, you can see here. Input 20 by 1, 20 by 1, hidden layer 1, hidden layer 1 with a 10 neurons, real loop activation function, hidden layer 2 with 10 neurons, real loop activation function, output 21. So output, we are going to have 21 classes, okay? So actually, ANN neural network, and this is convolutional neural network. So we try to, instead of using the multi-layer perceptron, we can use even the convolutional neural network also. This is the architecture that was used. And the training accuracy and testing accuracy were compared. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can see over here uh, the true two values are mean square error versus SNR for different values of SNR. See, one advantage of this thing is uh, we you know, computed this to the complex paper. Uh, if you add more amount of value, you see here, uh, signal to noise ratio, we compared it from 0 to 30 degree, 30 degree. Actually, this is not practical. If for the negative signal to noise ratio also, we have done this. I don't remember whether those sides are included here. Let me see. Yeah, uh, even for this particular machine learning based DO estimation, one advantage is even at very high noises, it is accurately detecting the target, which is not possible with the conventional algorithm, whether it is mu zeta squared or average expensive correlation based on whatever it is. Uh, this machine learning based DO estimation algorithm, uh, what we have seen is uh, even at very high signal to noise ratios, those, those results were not available over here, but still. Uh, that statement I can able to say it to you. Okay. And uh, see, one thing what we had tried to do is uh, in a musical algorithm. Actually, uh, let let me give some introduction to the musical algorithm because we try to uh, combine this machine learning algorithm with the musical algorithm to get a more accurate uh, angular parameter estimation. So usually in musical algorithm, what we try to do is we try to divide the uh, we'll try to divide the received signal into noise subspace and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll try to divide the received signal. See, <coughs> X is the received signal here. So we'll try to calculate the auto <coughs> data coherence matrix. And uh, from this data coherence matrix, we'll calculate the eigenvalues in a, in a, a musical algorithm. Once we get the eigenvalues, what we'll try to do is we'll try to uh, make use of these eigenvalues to support the noise subspace and uh, <laughs> noise subspace and uh, signal subspace. Uh, from that, uh, I'll try to get the spatial spectrum of this uh, spatial spectrum of this music on. <clears throat> so, in uh, from the machine learning approach, as we try to have the <clears throat> as we try to have the uh, angles uh, divided with one degree resolution, in sense minus ten to plus ten degrees, uh, minus ten minus ten minus 10, with one degree resolution, <clears throat> we will try to have. Yeah, uh, just give me one minute. I, I will drink water. Uh, I'll just give me one minute. Okay. <coughs> Dear participants, if you have any queries, please uh, type in the chat box.
yeah thank you for uh, bearing with me uh, actually uh, what i'm trying to say is uh, this uh, deep learning based uh, mlp based do estimation field is to give the angles maybe it may say that uh, plus 9 degrees or plus 8 minus 10 degrees so it will try to give some angle but if at all the angle is let us assume uh, let us assume it is 3.67. 3.67 is the angle. That's 3.67 degrees. So 3.67 is a little close to 4. Maybe deep learning algorithm will use the angle as a 4 degrees. But 4 degrees is not accurate, right? 4 degrees is not accurate. So by making use of this neural network, where we are going to have three hidden layers, three hidden layers, and the classification problem by considering minus 10 to plus 10 degrees, uh, 3.67 degrees will be considered as a 4 degrees and it will give the output even for different noises also maybe minus uh, 10 db also we check to minus 20 db up to minus 20 db it is working finite if i'm not wrong minus 20 db means we are going to have a huge amount of noise okay signal to noise ratio is very very less okay so what we try to do is we try to cue this uh, see when it say that it is minus 4 uh, plus 4 degrees 3.67 uh, it is the uh, it is given the output as four plus four degrees because there is no class of 3.67 classification problem we define only 21 classes there is no class of 3.67 so it will be closer to the fourth uh, four degrees class so it will say that four degrees now what we try to do is uh, whatever the output that we are getting from this uh, deep neural network architecture that we again fed it back to the musical world so this four degrees uh, uh, in, instead of giving four degrees as input what we'll try to do is we'll try to give three degrees, uh, three to five. That means we will try to fix the uh, angle angle as three to five. So you see here, music algorithm will try to give the spatial spectrum. Spatial spectrum, you see here, this one example, this is a spatial spectrum. You see, uh, SNR 20 dB, it was checked. And you see here the spatial spectrum, uh, music algorithm performance, yeah. So these are the angles. So it is started from minus 100 to plus 100 degrees. Minus 100 to plus 100 degrees. Uh, so if you try to look over here, yeah, yeah, you see here. So the moment when we feed this particular music algorithm with these two angles, because I am expecting the uh, the spectrum of the spatial spectrum of uh, for the specific angles ranging from resolution three to five. So when we try to have the spatial set spectrum from three to five by making use of music algorithm by dividing the uh, by calculating the auto covariance matrix and then uh, dividing it to noise subspace and uh, noise subspace and signal subspace, we will be getting even a more accurate result compared to that of the conventional one. No doubt, straight away if we give it to the music algorithm, it will give me the data. But the point over there is at a low SNR, specifically at minus 10 dB, minus 15 dB, minus 20 dB. It, uh, this uh, music algorithm, uh, because of the uh, noise effect, it, it, it will not give the accurate results. So in that context, deep neural networks will give the good results in estimate because it is already trained to the, it is already pre-trained model, right? So that information, if it conveys to this one, then the chance of uh, getting more high precision angular failure is more. That's what I want to convey to you. I hope you people are getting what I'm trying to say. Uh, let me go ahead. Let me show some more slides. So maybe with a different different architectures, uh, maybe one of my students has done. You see, instead of music algorithm, MLE, maximum likelihood estimation, estimate algorithm also has been used. So the conventional methods, what I have shown, East period algorithm, matrix pencil, music, correlation, all were again, we can able to link it back to the music algorithm after completion of the first stage with the uh, neural networks. Neural network architecture, we will be having this as a second stage and we can able to get a, Good accuracy, accuracy, training accuracy, 60% training loss, uh, validation accuracy, validation loss. So maybe for different uh, architectures, different, different uh, uh, performances, you can be able to see. Uh, maybe that's the thing what I want to convey to you. Specifically, uh, the object motive over here is uh, uh, we can even consider the angular variable estimation or direction of variable estimation problem as a classification problem, and we can use the neural network architectures to perform this classification. 
Okay, so representation plays a key role here. So, which type of representation you are using, whether you are taking the direct received signal and then giving as input, or you, whether you are taking the auto covariance factor. See, so, uh, sometimes what we can do is uh, instead of giving feeding the neural network directly with the received and the received signals, you can calculate the auto covariance matrix and you can feed that. That's the good way of representing the received data that can be considered. And then you can feed it to the neural network for getting it trained. Okay. So data representation also plays a key role in this uh, direction of analysis. Okay, uh, let me take another uh, 15 or 20 minutes time for uh, this radar image. Radar image. This is one of my favorite areas where I did my PhD. So the, after my PhD, I switched to the angular parallelic connection because it is more or less linked to physics around it. So I can give more details about this radar image. So when it comes to the radar imaging, angular parallelic, uh, the angular resolution. Okay, angular resolution plays key role in the uh, in the direction of arrival or angular arrival estimation. And uh, in this uh, radar imaging, both angular arrival, uh, azimuthal resolution, and range resolution, both plays a key role. So you can see here, uh, this is actually the intensity profile. Intensity profile image means you can see you may not have, okay, you can have different colors, sir, but each color will represent different, different elevations. That's the point over here, okay? Each, uh, see, usually what happens is uh, when it comes to synthetic aperture radar imaging, we will, uh, we will uh, fix the antennas to the aircraft or satellite, something like this, and we'll make the uh, aircraft or satellite to move. It is something, see, the previous case, what we have considered is we'll fix the uh, antenna elements. Now, we will make a single antenna element to move, to move so that we will generate a synthetically an aperture. We synthetically, we'll generate an aperture. That's the reason why the name is considered synthetic aperture radar. This is a good example. So, uh, the, the, this, this particular platform, satellite will be made to move such that it will try to cover this entire region and based on this we will be getting the image of the surveillance area basically this is the idea behind the radar image whether it is a satellite borne radar imaging or uh, aircraft borne radar imaging aircraft means uh, usually sometimes uh, aircraft also can be used Okay, so this radar image concept can also be used in a ground penetrating radar to identify the uh, landmines. You can see over here, uh, this is a ground penetrating radar where from which you see uh, the signals were made to travel through the ground and it will try to identify the metallic places or it will try to identify even the uh, landmines usually are metallic in nature. Landmines usually are metallic in nature. Okay. Explosives inside the explosives, usually people will try to keep uh, this uh, metallic nails and all those things to create more damage. Basically, okay. So, th this is one such radar image. This is actually the intensity image. So, you cannot expect uh, from the radar images something like a pure ca camera images. You'll be usually getting this intensity range images, and from this, we'll be estimating. Uh, Based on the intensity profile, see, actually here, uh, green color represents uh, this much reflection coefficient. This uh, yellow color represents this much reflection coefficient. So this is the intensity profile image. Okay. So generating the images plays a key role over here. Generating the images plays a key role over here. Different algorithms are there to generate images from the raw radar data. Raw radar data. What I mean to say in this raw radar data is, Platform position one. Let me assume aircraft uh, is on the aircraft, the transmitting and receiver antenna is installed, and uh, this aircraft is where to move. So at position one, it will transmit and receive the signals, and it, the aircraft will start continuously moving in this direction. So we will try to fix some platform position, and at each platform position, what is the receiver signal? It's actually the time domain waveform that we are going to receive at each and every platform position, just like the way what we did in the direction of analysis. So platform position one, we are going to have the uh, receive data platform position two. We are going to have the receive data three, four, five. For each and every platform positions, actually, uh, uh, recently I talked with the uh, space uh, SAC Ahmedabad, space application center Ahmedabad. Uh, doing the simulations, what I have done, we usually we will consider 10 or 12, 15 platform positions. What he said, you know, uh, the usually in practical applications, it will be something like 1000 platform positions in the sense. For uh, in the thousand platform positions, we'll be having a thousand different signals. Thousand signals we'll be having. 
okay so platform position one will be having the result signal two will be having the result signal so all these platform positions uh, at all these platform positions the surveillance region remains the same that point we need to keep in mind so uh, when uh, when we try to have a moving uh, aircraft or moving satellite this surveillance uh, uh, region remains the same and even whether it moves to, towards this direction or that direction this region it has to be focused okay so at each and every platform position we will try to have the received signal and once we get the received signal which is the time domain waveform at each and every platform let us say 100 platform positions 100 platform positions we are going to have uh, 100 different signals these different signals we will take and we will try to do some uh, imaging algorithms we will try to apply it to some imaging algorithms one such application one such imaging of the uh, imaging algorithm is back projection algorithm range migration algorithm uh, Okay, uh, FK migration algorithm. So many uh, algorithms are there that will help us to convert the time domain waveform into images. So images something like this. These are the images which we usually get from the radar image. So fr from the intensity profile, we will try to identify what will be the location of the target. Okay, whether it is the target or uh, something else. See, as I told you, you cannot uh, distinguish the object shape. Uh, it's not possible to identify the object shape, whether uh, there is some nail or something else. It is not possible. But based on the red uh, cross section, maybe one can able to look after the area of the coverage of that particular object, how much area it is going to have occupied. That we can able to assess. Based on, again, the only information that we are going to have is the reflected echo signal. Reflected echo signal is the only place where we are going to have. If you are much more bothered about the resolution of the image, now this is the place where we need to go for a wide bandwidth. If you don't use wide bandwidth over here, you cannot distinguish two targets which are very close to each other. And hence, even the very big, uh, that, that means, uh, the resolution capability, the distinguishing capability of the objects uh, will lose if we don't use a good resolution. That's the reason why nowadays people are using ultra wideband radar for uh, through the wall radar imaging and even broadband training radar. So, uh, they are the perspective and objective is uh, resolving the targets which are very close to each other. Okay, so th th this is the place where uh, we can uh, use both the uh, we can use this uh, range resolution concept and even the angular resolution concept. Okay. So as the number of platform positions increases, uh, as I told you, as the number of uh, platform position increases, you will be having a very, uh, very, uh, very large synthetic aperture, very large synthetic aperture. Very large synthetic aperture area means we have the scope of getting very narrow bandwidth. Obviously, the very narrow bandwidth means very good angular resolution. Very good azimuth resolution. Range resolution, azimuth resolution. Both plays key role over here. So to have very good azimuth resolution, we need to have very narrow bandwidth. For narrow bandwidth, we need to have more number of platform positions. As I told you, uh, hundreds and hundreds of platforms, 100, 200, 300, 400 platform positions here. Okay. With the, using a single antenna, we are not using a number of antennas here. We are not physically having a very good, very big aperture area. We are making, in, uh, we are. Uh, incorporating the antenna, we are uh, fixing the antenna to the aircraft or satellite, and we will make this aircraft or satellite to move so that it will generate an aperture area which is similar to that of the very large aperture area. Both in radar imaging, both range resolution and azimuth resolution uh, concepts were being used. Both both the concepts will be used in this particular radar imaging. Okay, so yeah, this is one good example. I think this will give you the good understanding. Synthetic aperture radar. So platform by A, B, C, D, these are the platform points what we are going to have. And you see here, I think the uh, uh, range resolution, and resolution, both are explained over here. You can see over here. Uh, this is the pulse that is being transmitted and range resolution, range resolution will be is equal to one by two the pulse width. This is actually the range resolution. So this is actually the range resolution and uh, res resolution cell. Actually, sometimes people call this as the bins also, range bins also as you call it cell. And this is the edge resolution. So that means if two targets are there in this particular cell, if two targets are there, let me be the most specific here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in this, part, in, in this particular cell, in this particular cell, if two targets were existing over here, your target, your radar is not in a position to uh, detect those two targets. Uh, your radar is not in a position to distinguish two targets because this is the azimuth resolution, this is the range resolution, this is the cell that we are going to have. Okay, 
so to have small uh, see when we would like to have good range resolution you try to reduce the pulse width you reduce the pulse width reduce the pulse duration then uh, the, the, this length will be getting reduced if you want to have a very good azimuth resolution even much more smaller than this yeah you increase the number of enhancement mode for this so both azimuth resolution and range resolution concept were required this is a resolution cell that we can will be concerned okay so uh, this is the way how we are going to use the synthetic aperture radar for radar imaging. We will try to get the received signals from all these platform positions, and from these platform positions, we will try to uh, use the uh, imaging algorithm. Imaging algorithms, maybe, uh, yeah, you will be SAR imaging. I will try to show some simulation results. So, this is the object space, and this is the data space where you are going to have, and this is the image space. Yeah, once, yeah, you can see over here. So uh, this is the, you can see here. This is the platform position, and with the, uh, one target is there in this particular range. And I think this is the back position. Yeah, advantage of back position algorithm is that it can be extended without much effort to, to other. Yeah, this is based on the back projection algorithm. So actually, these are the targets that were located. You can see here. These are the targets that were located. Target one, and target two. Again, I am saying whether the target is uh, some uh, black box, a metallic box, or something else. No, we are not in the position. These are the intensity. Problem. You see, this is zero intensity. I hope you can able to see my cursor. Let me do this. Yeah, you can see this is this blue color is zero intensity profile means you are not getting any reflected echo from this particular image. And as the color intensity profile value goes on increases, increases, and when you try to reach this exactly hundredth position with a pure yellow, your more reflection is there, and hence you can able to say that there is a there is the location of the target, metallic target. If at all you have a metallic target somewhere over here, here also you'll be getting this yellow color intensity profile. This is by making use of the uh, back projection. See, actually, what this is, says is at this particular platform position, whatever the received signal that we are going to have, you will be having some time domain wave from here at this particular uh, target position. Uh, this is actually the platform position. Radar platform position. So here you are going to have the received signal. With that received signal alone, with the received signal at uh, this platform position, if you use only the received signal at this particular data alone, and if you try to fill the total image map, this is actually considered as the image map, you will be having arc like structures. These are the intensities that you will be getting. Okay, now at platform one, platform two, platform three, platform four, all platform positions, if you try to combine, so the here up to this particular point, if you try to combine all, you are going to get something like this. Now, if you try to consider this one also, you'll be getting something like this. At this particular point of view. so for, from this 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 is actually cross range cross range means azimuthal down range means range direction cross range means azimuthal so for each and all for all the platform positions whatever the received signals that we are going to have all those received signals uh, we'll try to uh, map it back to the image space so here you can able to say object space data space and image space image space means you'll be having pixels again I'm saying it is SAR imaging we will be having only the time domain waveform. Uh, time domain waveform. So this time domain waveform we are going to use to fill this image map, and hence we are going to have this. Uh, this is actually the conventional approach. We haven't used any machine learning approaches over here. Yeah, uh, delay and some algorithm is one more algorithm. Back position algorithm is another algorithm. You know, these are the algorithms that people use for uh, uh, radar imaging. And uh, now we were still in a process of uh, uh, handling this radar imaging problem using machine. So in, in the sense that we need to, uh, because the output, what we are expecting is the image here. Uh, yeah, you can see over here, uh, the three-dimensional plot of these images, I will try to see, this is the peak position that we are going to have, three-dimensional plot. Uh, maybe in NATLAB, if you are framing here, you can able to have a 3D plot of the images. Mesh, mesh plot, or mesh grid, you can able to use. So these are the places where you are going to have two targets. This is one target, this is, this is a 3D plot. Okay, so we are still in a process of handling this uh, radar imaging problem in a, using machine learning approaches, particularly using neural networks. We are still in the process. You may see different papers also that might have already incorporated this. We are studying those things, and uh, maybe in the future, you can even apply this machine learning techniques for this radar imaging problem also. So, with this information, uh, I would like to conclude my lecture. Uh, if you have any queries, I am happy to. Take your queries and uh, uh, clarify the concepts, whatever is required. Okay. Now the session is open to you.
okay now maybe all these details and not uh, okay based on the understanding what you are having if required i can able to explain these things so i'm just leaving it to the audience now uh, yeah uh, now the session is open for discussion i don't know how many of you are really uh, thank you sir thank you for your session is it uh, conclusion or yeah it's concluded sir uh, uh, if if it all the participants have queries i can yeah right uh thank you kishor yeah uh, i have so one much. question uh, for yeah. you uh, yes sir please this uh, but uh, uh when you deal with uh, uh, radars mounted on vehicles how yes, these sir. challenges will differ because everybody is talking about uh, uh, autonomous vehicles in somewhat uh, we are using radar mounted uh, radar vehicle mounted radars right yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. Uh, how these challenges will differ when you are taking a, a static radar here or when you go for vehicle mounted things uh, no challenges in the sense uh, basically uh, see when, when we try to mount the radar on on on, on top of any vehicle for that matter uh, again the transmission and receiving will remain the same whether it is a stationary uh, uh, stationary platform or moving platform the transmission and receiving will remain the same but uh, when it comes to the moving platform we will try to fix the platform positions in the sense uh, uh, by the time when we try doing the on time let 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 me assume that uh, the uh, the the vehicle is at point one during the on time so it will try to transmit the signal and uh, by the time when the signal pulse is in off off state uh, the position of the uh, position of the vehicle will be moved to some other place so we need to consider the motion of the the speed at which the vehicle is moving uh, that we need to consider when we try to make use of this uh, radar image. So, is because when it comes to the stationary platform position, means uh, the the on time and off time will fix will be fixed, and uh, uh, it won't create that much problem uh, specifically because uh, R one the range will be fixed. But when we when we try to have a moving uh, platform, then uh, these values will change. The on time will be changed, off time also will change. At the same time, uh, what I mean to say on and off time is uh, the time at which the distance at which the platform position uh, has been traveled. Based on that, the range will get affected. Based on that, the range will get affected. That we need to consider it how much range, whether it is increased or decreased. That range value we will try to calculate it by making use of the velocity equation of the uh, moving platform and that we will try to incorporate in the received signal because it will be if it if the range has been reduced then the delay will be reduced that we need to incorporate it uh, in the received signal in the model in the model when we try to have the if the raw data is already there then we need to consider these parameters these are the complex parameters which uh, we need to consider uh, specifically when uh, there is a moving platform position Okay. Uh, usually, what happens is uh, we always try to simulate the raw data uh, in the laboratory environment, unless we have some real practical data. Practical data, it is very difficult to get. So, in that case, we need to generate the raw data by considering all these parameters aspect, and even for the reconstruction of the remaining algorithms also, these parameters we need to consider uh, while uh, while uh, localize while getting the radar images. Okay. Maybe this is a little information what I can say. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Kishore, for your uh, insightful presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, your expertise and uh, passion have truly enriched our understanding and inspired us to implement uh, new strategies uh, while we are uh, teaching this particular subject, uh, radar engineering. Uh, we are grateful for your time and uh, valuable contribution. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sachkumar sir, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my expertise with you people. So you can uh, contact me at any point of time at whatever the support that you require. Maybe you can share my details with the participants also. So once again, I would like to thank all the organizers and the participants for bearing with me for the past two hours. 
uh, actually i am again saying i am the student of such kumar sir i am very fond to be over here i would like to convey my heartfelt thanks to such kumar sir for giving me this opportunity uh, thank you sir thank you so much sir. thank you thank you. any more questions from the participants yeah questions for the participants if any other please sir uh, few participants also Uh, you are right, sir. If possible, you can share the. See, uh, actually, uh, I can say something. The fundamental slides, I don't have any problem to share, but uh, uh, the result slides uh, were not up to the mark. What I can you say? Let the participants uh, contact me, sir. Uh, what uh, based on uh, the need of them, I can able to uh, share those details, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You, I will send you my mail ID. Please send to them. Then I will forward to the participants. No, no. What I am asking is, uh, so, uh, the slides which I have shown to you, introductory slides are clear, proper. When it comes to the results, uh, things has to be organized properly. So, based on the interest of the participants, let let them contact me, and I'll talk to them based on the conversation, whatever is required. Because slides are not proper, I can share the appropriate papers which were uh, there in support of these slides, so that they'll get even much more understanding. So just okay. from the slides we can get nothing else. So what I suggest you to do is share my contact details. Maybe if you want, I can drop it over here, my email ID and phone number, so that they can able to contact me. And based on their need, I can share. I'm I'm not saying okay. that I will not share. I'll I'll do it. But uh, okay. uh, okay. if they should be clear about what they want, at least that's okay. the intention behind saying this thing. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Even I, I can share you the presentation also, but uh, I found that the last slides are not proper as such. Uh, that's the reason why I'm saying this thing. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Sir. Okay. No, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. So. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I extend. On behalf of the Department of PC VVIT, uh, head of the department and other faculty members, I extend my sincere thanks to the management of Vasudev Devanagari Institute of Technology for their constant support in terms of uh, uh, whatever the support they have provided moral, morally and financially. I'm very much thankful to the resource persons, uh, Mrs. Professor Brinda Bomik, Professor R. Nakiran. Professor Ernest Paul Ijina, Professor B K N Srinivasrao, and Dr. Rajiv Lochana, and finally Dr. Kulkishor sir, uh, for accepting our invitation and handling uh, the valuable sessions. I extend my heartfelt thanks to the principal VVIT, Dr. Y Mal Malikarjun Reddy Garu, and Dean of Academics, Dr. K Girivab Garu, for their valuable suggestions before and throughout the uh, this FDP. Special thanks to the head of the department, E.C. Uh, of this college, Dr. M. Y. Banmurthy Garu, without whom it, it couldn't be possible to conduct this uh, FDP because of his valuable suggestions. And I'm very much grateful to the teaching faculty as well as the non-teaching staff of the department of E.C. for their support and managing other aspects of this FDP. Finally, thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, to one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, can I leave, sir? Ah, okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Participants are requested to submit the feedback form as a mail. Thank mm -hmm. you. 